Hi, everybody. Welcome to our event tonight. My name is Amy Fletcher, and I am a community librarian with Regina Public Library. This is Vicki Kraus, and the Education Coordinator and Administrative Assistant at the Saskatchewan Sports Hall of Fame. Together, we will be hosting this event tonight. I wanted to welcome you all to celebrate the Olympics with the Saskatchewan Sports Hall of Fame and Regina Public Library. We will be using Zoom webinar for this event. Since we are using Zoom webinar, your microphones are already muted. That way your microphone doesn't pick up any background noise and interrupt other people when they are speaking. You can send your questions to the chat during the panel discussion or during the question and answer period with the Olympians. My coworker Courtney, who is the events coordinator with Regina Public Library, will be monitoring the chat for your questions and the Olympians will answer your questions either as they arise or during the question and answer period. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the land that we call home here in Regina is Treaty 4 territory and the traditional tr territory of the Cree, Soto, Dakota, Lakota, and Nakota and the homeland of the Métis. We recognize the diverse indigenous peoples whose footsteps have marked this territory. I will now pass it over to Vicki who will tell us more about the Saskatchewan Sports Hall of Fame and who will also introduce us to our Olympians tonight. Great, thank you, Amy. Thank you, everybody, and good evening. Thank you for um, attending our, our webinar tonight. Um, the Saskatchewan Sports Hall of Fame was established in 1966 to honor the outstanding Saskatchewan athletes, championship teams, and sport builders, as well as preserving the sport history of Saskatchewan. There are currently 527 inductees into the Hall of Fame. 239 athletes, 163 builders, and 125 championship teams with 52 sports that are represented. Our collection contains more than 19,000 sport artifacts and archives that really tell the story of sport and sport history in Saskatchewan. So we're located at 2205 Victoria Avenue, right downtown Regina, and have recently reopened to visitors. So we're hoping to many of you will come and visit us this summer. So, um, the 2020-2021 Olympic Games that are starting this Friday, July 23rd, and go to our August 8th is, of course, an unprecedented uh, Olympic Games having been delayed for one year. They're in Tokyo, Japan. And then following that, the Paralympics will start August 24th to September 5th. So I don't know about you, but I'm pretty excited for the Olympics to start. It's, it's a highlight of my life every two years, winter and two years um, then again to the, the Summer Olympics. So really looking forward to, so to help everyone get ready for the games, we've assemb assembled a panel of Olympians to talk about their experiences and what it was like to be an Olympic athlete. Now, unfortunately, one of our Olympic coaches, Shannon Miller, who coached women's hockey in the 1998 Olympics is not able to join us tonight due to a family emergency, but we do have two incredible individuals who have actually been announced as part of our next class of inductees into the Saskatchewan Sports Hall of Fame. So we're really excited to welcome these two gentlemen to be part of our Hall of Fame. And we're really excited to welcome them tonight to tell you about their Olympic uh, stories. So first is Justin Abdu, who is a wrestler who uh, was from Moose Jaw and who competed at the 2000 Sid Sydney Olympics. He has won a gold medal at the 1994 Commonwealth Games, a nine-time Canadian champion. Justin also won the Cadet World Championships in 1987. So welcome, Justin. Uh, Lyndon Rush competed in two Winter Olympic Games and coached in one. So he was at 2010 and 2014 as an athlete in the sport of bobsleigh and won a bronze medal piloting the four-man team in Vancouver in 2010 on home soil. He also won a two-man World Cup title in 2012, 2013. Lyndon, whose hometown is Humboldt, Saskatchewan, started out as a football player at the University of Saskatchewan before changing his sport to bobsleigh. So that's pretty interesting. So thank you, Lyndon, for being here with us tonight. So now I'm going to pass that over to Amy. So she's going to start with our some of our questions for our panelists. Okay. Hi, Justin and Lyndon. So this question is for both. Um, so as you know, you both grew up in small, smallish town, Saskatchewan. Um, so we're wondering, like, where 
um, how did you first get involved with sports and what sports do you first remember playing as um, kids? Sure. I want to go first. <laughs> Justin, you go. Okay. Thanks, Linda. Maybe we can alternate back and forth. I'll go first once, then you go first once. Yeah, um, your turn. Yeah, I'm older than you, so there you go. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, growing up in Moose Jaw, was, uh, it was a great experience because it was, it's a very uh, sporting community. It, uh, sports are a big part of um, everything kids do in Moose Jaw. Uh, but I also grew up in a sporting family. Uh, my mother was uh, at one time a uh, national level speed swimmer. My father uh, played for the 66 Rams that are in the Saskatchewan Hall of Fame and won a national title. He also wrestled at college and was a uh, Canadian National uh, University champion for, for Gord Garvey who coached him, who's also in the Hall of Fame. So I grew up in a sporting family uh, most of my memories from a young age revolve around sports. Uh, memories like being uh, taken to the pool at 6.30 a.m. for a swim, uh, swim, swim racing um, when it's 40 below, stuff like that. So um, I, I grew up speed swimming, uh, youth basketball, then football, hockey, wrestling. Um, kind of grew up in a school where all the good athletes sort of did everything. So didn't specialize in sports till later on. I loved wrestling right from the time um, – my dad allowed me to do it, which was right around nine, 10 years old when he was coaching his uh, junior high team and he'd bring me to practice and I would start wrestling along with them. But um, just great memories of all the different sports I was involved in, in in Moose Jaw and the great coaches I had all along the way. Well, thank you. So it seems like you have basically tried it all. Yeah, my story is similar in Humboldt. Um, sports is huge as well. And I played everything, everything I could. Um, as a kid, I, my favorite class in school was gym. And <laughs> I uh, was, you know, hockey was my first love. And then I played football and soccer and rugby was a big sport in Humboldt as well that we did a lot. And the one thing when I, when I look back and think about uh, growing up in a small town and how it uh, really affected me was uh, the coaches that I had, I wasn't just another kid. I was like Jerry Rush's son and they knew our Chelsea Rush's little brother, like all the coaches knew me or my family outside of the sport as well. So I feel like there's a different investment in athletes when you have a personal relationship where in big cities, I don't know. If, I'm not saying that the, the coaches wouldn't do as good of a job, but I really feel like I had an advantage um, because my coaches had a, more of a, an investment in me as a kid. And they were not only just trying to get the best out of me as a athlete, but they were trying to make me a better citizen. And I think that that really, that really helped me going forward when I look back. Very interesting. Yeah, Sorry, go ahead. No, you go ahead. Okay. So, so my question would be, so you all, you both started many, many sports. Um, so when did you decide that, you just wanted to concentrate on one specific sport. And do you remember any sacrifices that you had to make in order to, to really concentrate and try and reach that elite level? So do you want to go yeah, first? From, Lyndon? It's my turn. Yeah. <laughs> for me, that happened. Uh, it was actually football was the first sport that I had to decide I was going to do. I, I loved hockey and a lot of, I, I played a lot of hockey and rugby and stuff. But hockey and football kind of came to a, a head. I had to decide if I wanted to continue playing football or if I wanted to go play AAA hockey. Humboldt didn't have a hockey, a AAA midget program. And um, I decided to stay home and play AA midget hockey and football. And then after that, that sort of, my path kind of started to set my path. I could have still maybe made it in hockey, but I kind of, that's where the decision started. And then um, I ended up choosing to go to university and play football and which led to me getting recruited for uh, bobsleigh. Wow. That's a very interesting story, Lennon. And um, it's not that different than my own. So uh, growing up in Moose Jaw, I think I had an opportunity uh, like you did in Humble, um, where I wasn't getting pressure to just choose one sport. Um, at a young age, I was doing a lot of sports. I remember getting to about 13, 14, and my parents saying, you can't do them all anymore. 
Um, when I got to high school, I really focused on, on my three main ones, which were wrestling, uh, hockey, and football. Uh, by the time I was 17, I was listed in the Warriors organization. I was playing my uh, second year at AAA Midget. We were fortunate enough to have a team in Moose Jaw. I was on a provincial high school football uh, championship team, and I was wrestling at uh, the world level for Canada. So um, really at 17, I still thought maybe I could play them all. My, <laughs> my dad who was very more, way more perceptive than me, knew there was, there was going to become a time where I was going to have to choose. When I, just before I turned 18, the Warriors traded me to Medicine Hat. Um, they didn't have a junior wrestling program or a high school wrestling program in Medicine Hat. So I didn't play hockey my grade 12 year. And even going into my first year at Simon and Fraser, I, I felt like I could play both sports. Um, I'd signed in a wrestling scholarship on a partial football, uh, but I made the junior world team that year and, and world were in November, kind of right in the middle of football playoffs. So um, that was the year I decided to focus on wrestling and um, yeah, worked out well for me. I got to wrestle for Canada's uh, senior team for 12 years and uh, got to go all the way to the Olympics. But when I think about the sacrifices that I had to make, I, I really never felt like I was ever making a sacrifice. It was just, I just love to play sports. I know my family made lots of those driving me around um, playing. A, I remember playing a, a provincial hockey game in in Estevan and then it being driven back to Yorkton for a football game on the same day. Um, just lots of shoveling around, lots of sacrifices for my family. And I'm, I'm sure Lyndon had, had the same in Humboldt growing up. Wow. Thank you. So I know you both kind of touched on this, but like more specifically, um, when did you realize that the Olympics were even an option for you in the maybe even like the one sport that you selected? Oh, it's my turn now, right? That's right. If I were going back and forth, it's nice sharing. Teach my kids this. Um, for me, uh, the club I grew up in, Moose Jaw, uh, was run by uh, my dad, uh, Frank Gabby, and Terry Pace. And they both wrestled at Lakehead University in Ontario for Gord Garvey, Dr. Gord Garvey, who's a member of the Hall of Fame. And uh, so I'd met Gord several times, and he was a 68 Olympian. He was also uh, drafted by the Saskatchewan Rough Riders in the CFL, so another multi sport athlete. So I would hear lots of stories about the Olympics from them. Uh, my high school coach, Terry Pace, wrestled in the 76 Olympics himself, uh, got fifth in Montreal for Canada. So it was just being that close to that kind of wrestling royalty, I, I just, I guess, grew up naive thinking, you know, all good wrestlers go to the Olympics. I was fortunate enough in, in 1982 as an 11 year old to get to go watch the World Wrestling Championships in Edmonton. And that's when I really got to see the very best in the world competing uh, it's not some of those same wrestlers compete for medals in Los Angeles in 84. So I think during that time between 82 and 84, I really felt like uh, if I'm going to choose wrestling, um, I want to be an Olympian. I want to represent my country. I want to do my very best to bring a medal home for Canada, which obviously didn't happen for me. But uh, I was fortunate enough to get to go wrestle for Canada in Sydney. Uh, one of the best sporting experiences I've had in my entire career. So I had the dream at a young age and I. Uh, I feel like a lot of the kids in our club had that just because we were surrounded by it. Yeah, definitely. So if you're around something, it can definitely feel like more of a possibility. Yeah, for me, it was, um, I dreamed of Stanley Cups and Grey Cups, and I never really thought much about the Olympics because I didn't do a sport that was, I guess hockey was in the Olympics, but I loved watching it. And I remember as a kid watching bobsleigh and thinking that um, bobsledders were, I remember thinking those guys are impressive because I, they had, you know, they had to wear this, the tight suits. You could see them pushing. You could see they had big muscles and, you know, gripping down a track. I remember thinking that's a, like a, a barbarian sport almost. I remember thinking those guys are crazy and tough. Mm -hmm. I remember thinking that. And, but um, when I was recruited, I was recruited. My, my career was quite scripted, actually. When um, I, I graduated from university in 2003, and Canada, I think, got the bid for the 2010 games in, like, 2002. Maybe it was even 2003. And that's when they started the Own the Podium um, initiative. And they decided that if we're going to host the Olympics in 2010, we want to win some medals. 
And so they started investing into the sports and bobsleigh got a bunch of money for recruiting athletes. And I was part of that initial recruitment drive. So the, the, they, they were thinking in 2003, these athletes that we, we recruit will be ready for the 2010 games. So there was a whole whack of us that got recruited. And it was a great time to come into the sport because there was money for development. And I just started, yeah, I, I, I came in knowing that. And I just, yeah, I, I, I was, you know, fed through the system. I kind of, um, I, I, I sort of made my way to the top and it all kind of went to their plan. It's sort of funny when looking back at it, they, you know, in 2003, they invested this, they did this inc- recruitment drive and, in 2010, sure enough, I won a medal for them. So it was pretty cool looking at it in hindsight. Yeah, that's really interesting to hear about the recruitment drive and the own the podium, own the podium um, initi- initiative. So like how much, we got a question from someone here. So how much like support though, like during this, were you able to like receive or if you received any from your friends, family, like the provincial government like can you like maybe go more into like the type of training that you received or anything like that yep so um when I started I had a job it wasn't a full-time gig yet they I was I moved to Calgary with my wife and I got a job at Totem Building Supplies and which was close to the Canada Olympic Park and I was uh stocking shelves there and then after I'd go and train and practice bobsleigh and I would um I think after my first season I received um sort of the the lowest level of uh they call it carding it's a stipend system that the government has for athletes and I don't remember but it was something like 800 bucks a month so not bad it, and it's also tax-free money so you don't have to pay tax on it and then I made I did that for a couple of years and I moved up to a senior level card where you get I think it was 1500 bucks a month but if you had kids they threw another 300 and i, I can't remember but and if you did well you I, I when i maxed out the carding was around two thousand dollars a month and it was tax-free money so it wasn't too bad um and then my home province saskatchewan also would give a third of whatever the national government gave so i got you know another uh, it was around, you know, 600, 700 bucks from Saskatchewan. So, yeah, I was able to support my young family doing bobsleigh. It was, oh. it was, there were some lean years and some prayerful nights I'm in there, but it, it all worked out. Um, the Canadian system is pretty cool the, that way, how, how they, um, we, Canada's not known for really having highly paid athletes, like in, you know, we always look at the Americans and they have spo- like because of the sponsorship, right? The Americans mm-hmm. will always have big comp- corporations that can put big chunks of money towards athletes representing them and stuff. But in Canada, we do have a good system that uh, can can make it happen. And it worked for me. That's great. Thank you. So, Justin, when you were training for the Olympics, were you also working as well? I sure was. So, um I grew up in the Saskatchewan system and I was part of a Canada winter games team. And then also two years later, Canada summer games because wrestling got switched from the winter to the summer. So I was in the last ever winter games where wrestling was competed in the first day of our summer games. So during that time I was in high school, but there was some money through the Saskatchewan government called SAS first, trying to get us to win titles. Uh, we won them both in wrestling both those years. So I was fortunate enough to have uh, some of that help. And then in 1980, I became nationally carded, much like Lyndon. So um, that money, so he's talking about 2000. When I first got carded in 88, it was $350 a month and tuition. And the last year I was carded was uh, 99, 2000. I was actually top eight in the world that year. So I got bumped to an A card and A card was 850. And I remember when I retired from wrestling, a year later, they doubled it all. So it was seven. Oh. The A card went from eight fifty to seven hundred. But I'm not going to complain because I had a job as a graduate assistant at SFU. I was a part time job. There was occasionally, and there may have been this in bobsleigh as well. Occasionally in Europe, there was prize money at events, and I would do wrestling camps. And yeah, I managed to piecemeal myself a, a real nice career 
uh, where I could continue to train and wrestle for Canada full time. And it wasn't by no means a full time job, but it turned into one when I retired. So um, I learned how to multitask and I really appreciated all those people who were helping me. And there was all kinds of support happening uh, besides financial support as well. I know there was a lot of people that were alumni from SFU that would lend their hand in the physiotherapy, the chiropractics, the mental training, all those different things that now on the podium has taken a hold of and, and made it really professional. Um, in the late 90s, it wasn't wasn't quite like that. So I really appreciate all the help I got from everybody. Thank you. Yeah, that, that um, I think having a, an Olympics on home soil really pushed some of those initiatives forward, which is so great for our Canadian athletes. But once you both realized that you would be going to the Olympics, when that moment hit you, what did you do to prepare in order to compete at the Olympic level? So like your training, your diet, your exercise, mental training, any of those, like those, those weeks preceding your Olympic competition, what did those look like? Okay, I guess I get to go first again. Uh, for me, I've been part of the system already since 90. I was on the national team in 90. I had planned to be a 92 Olympian. That didn't work out because um, I lost. And then I was certain to be a 96 Olympian. I mean, I was in the prime of my career in 96. And once again, I lost. So um, by the time I got to 2000, I had the whole uh, Olympic cycle thing down to a uh, down to a T, except for the fact you actually have to get make the team and then qualify the weight and then go to the Olympics. So I was part of a, a, a program that um, already produced multiple Olympic medalists at that time. So we had the strength and conditioning the mental training, we had our yearly training plans all set out. Um, unfortunately for me, during my Olympic qualification process, I had an injury and it looked at some, at one point where I was maybe not gonna get back in time to qualify the way for the Olympics. So there was a lot of me rehabbing, me listening to my body, me doing the best training I could. So when I finally actually got the final qualification, there was, there was a lot of relief there. Lyndon? Yeah. Um, it, it, sort of like what Justin was saying, it's like you're sort of in, you're in this world already and the Olympics is just kind of like the next race coming up. <laughs> Every year in bobsleigh, we had world championships, except for on uh, Olympic seasons. You have the, you, have, you don't have world championships, you have an Olympic games instead. And so um, our training is built to peak you for a, the big race every year. So we, we were building every season, you're building up and to be peaked for this uh, big race. And on the Olympic year, it's the Olympic games. So it, it actually wasn't that much different. It was different because it, the big, the, the thing for me, my first Olympics was in Canada and that was what changed. That's why it was so different. Cause like, Every time I got in my car and drove somewhere and listened to the sports radio, somebody, they, they'd talk about the 2010 games, how the preparations are coming. And I'd feel a little pit in my stomach. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like every, you know, it was just, it was everywhere because I was Canadian and it was, the Olympics were going to be in Canada. So that was the big difference was like, I was always preparing for uh, a big race, but nobody was paying attention, but, now everybody was paying attention. So that was the big, the big change. So I prepared the same I would. And, and, and I was actually pretty immature in my career at the 2010 Olympics. I got better at preparing for the big race as my career went on. But the things that I learned in 2010 helped me uh, in, in future world championships, Olympics. And it helps me a lot as a coach just to know what the athletes are kind of going through. But yeah, I can't really say anything other than I, I had to learn to be tougher mentally because people were paying attention. That was the big difference. Mm -hmm. So it's like the Olympics is just another competition, right? But it's a much bigger competition. Yeah, it's, it's, it is just another race, mm -hmm. but it doesn't feel like that. <laughs> I would say I would say the same thing. The mat's the same size. The opponents are the same size. Um, just a lot more people are watching. Reminds me of the uh, 
the um, scene in the movie Hoosiers where Gene Hackman takes his team to the big stadium. And in, if you've ever seen Hoosiers and he has the measure of the court and he says, look, it's the same size court we play on at home. But obviously you're in a fishbowl for those two weeks. Um, probably our sport, even a little more than Linden's, but I know his isn't considered a super high profile sport either. So when you get to that every four years where you're in the Olympics, that's where people start paying attention. And so um, you keep telling yourself it's just another event, but yeah, I mean, uh, mm -hmm. whether you believe yourself or not is the question. <laughs> oh, for sure. So I just had another question pop up from the Q&A. So I'm just gonna go ahead and ask that. Um, how are you feeling with like the Olympics going ahead with the pandemic right now? And if you were, if you were training for Tokyo 2020 and you still had an opportunity and you were really trying to go like, would you want to go like with everything that's going on? Yeah, so I guess I'll go first. Um, I remember the young man that I was and nothing would have stopped me. <laughs> I shouldn't say nothing, but I was very determined to go to these, go to the Olympics and win and do very well. Um, I'm sure that if I was an, a young man training for these Olympics, I would, COVID would be, it would not be very high on my list of concerns. I, that's just how singular minded athletes get. And I know that, you know, there's, there's other people around them to worry about that. And I would have, I would have trusted my coaches, team doctors, that kind of stuff to worry about that. And I, I would have just, yeah, I wouldn't have, uh, it wouldn't have um, stopped my preparation at all. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, um, in my Olympics, I was it was my third third crack at it, um, and I was at, at the end of my career, so I don't. I don't it would have taken quite a bit to keep me away from that uh, that experience. It was something that I felt uh, my my accomplishments, my resume was missing, um, and I, I would have done anything to get there. Uh, looking at uh, the preparations, and what the Canadian team has done in preparing for Japan, I obviously there's mixed feelings there. You worry about and bringing different strains to the Japanese people or having this different wave. But it feels like from my end, I'm involved with the national program at some level, not as much as I once was, uh, but we have two of our alumni going uh, to represent their countries at the Olympics. Uh, both are medal hopefuls. Um, I'm just really hopeful that nobody fails a test and is denied that opportunity um, at the last minute to compete for their country, something they've worked their whole life for. And both of these girls are are in their very last uh, quad. They're not going to make it another four years. So, yeah, I'm keeping my fingers crossed that they pass all their tests and and maintain all the good protocols that they're supposed to be doing. Well, thank you. So, um, I feel like most athletes have experienced training blocks. If this has ever happened to you, can you tell us about a time where you overcame a mental or training block in your sport? I guess it's my turn to go first now. So um, I think with, uh, that there's two different things that really set you back in, in the sport of wrestling. One is an injury, and I already talked about having one of those. But uh, I think the other thing, when you talk about training blocks, where you feel like you're just not getting better, and, and that's, that's going to happen in your career because there's going to be different highs, different lows, different plateaus. Um, I think the best thing you can do when things don't seem to be going well is um, – some type of refresh, whether a little change of scenery for a different training, a different training partner, um, revisiting why you're doing the sport, uh, what kind of things um, you, you're getting out of it besides victory or, or, or monetary gain or, or fame. I think people that get really locked down and are super successful are super successful for a reason. It's because they're so focused, but sometimes that single focus um, you can get inside your own head and I see it more as a coach than I ever did as an athlete uh, because I'm more aware. Um, and sometimes you just have to take a step back or two so you can take uh, some step, extra steps forward. Thank and you. asking for help is never a, never a bad thing. It's not a sign of weakness. A lot mm -hmm. of athletes, uh, both female and male that I work with, uh, have this idea that they're invincible and, and that the expectation is they do everything by themselves. And, and that's not, that's not, uh, safe and that's not uh, effective thank you uh, for me 
am in, in, in my sport, I think the thing that comes to mind right away as a bobsleigh pilot is fear. Um, you have a bad crash. And as a pilot, you're always responsible for the, your crew, the guys. And if you're a girl, the girls behind you. And that's that can weigh heavy on you. And pretty much all like <laughs> crashing is a part of our sport. And our sport is scary, especially when you go to a new track that you don't know that well. And you, there's nothing better in the, in the world, I think, than going down a bobsleigh track the first time. It's amazing. It's all, it's terrifying and exhilarating. And it's the, if you're the right kind of person, I should say some people don't, don't want, don't like that. But for me, it's amazing. But um, everybody has um, times where they are, when they, when they, when they get, when they run into a hurdle. And I think of um, my 2010 Olympic experience is pretty, it's a pretty good story because we went into the, 2010 games as favorites to win a medal in the two man and sort of had a sort of outside shot uh, uh, team for the four man. We had, we had a really strong two man season and in the two man race, I crashed. I was in all the training runs for two man. I was fastest or second fastest in every run. And I went I, in the first, I did, we do four runs in the first run. I was sitting in third after the first run but really close to second and uh, first and the second run, I was, I was letting it all hang out and I was having a really good run, but I made a little mistake and I, I, I left it hang out and I, I ended up crashing mm -hmm. and nobody got hurt, but crashing is, you know, especially at the Olympics, it was a, it was a, it was traumatic. <laughs> I remember being in the sled thinking that maybe I'm dreaming right now. Like, you know what I mean? Like I went to the and I've crashed and I've just blown it. And um, I, a big thing for me is my faith. And that's what really helped me get through that situation. Um, I'm a Christian and I used my uh, Christian beliefs and my relationship with my spiritual, with God to help me through that moment. Cause it was, you know, people think, yeah, it's just a sport, but it was, it, it was a, it's a big deal. And um, I was able to come through that, I think. And I, I, may, I think maybe I'm going to share with you guys so, so, something. So like um, going into the Olympics, I have I was peaked physically and I was peaked mentally. And I have we have a chaplain that worked with, worked with us at the time. And he always told me, he said, you need to be spiritually peaked for the Olympics. And I know now why I needed to be spiritually peaked because that accident, that crash that I had, was so traumatic and could have really derailed the whole system. But I ended up um, in the situation where we crashed. Um, my spiritual training kicked in and, and I a little, a little thing coming to my head said, think of something to be thankful for. Like I'm laying in the sled, just came to a stop. And I thought of my teammate, um, Chris LeBehan, who races in the four man. Mm -hmm. His wife had a baby boy that day. And I, th I said, thank you, God, for that healthy little baby boy. And it kind of turned something in my heart right away. So I was able to get up out of the sled and I, you know, I just blown it. And I was, I had to go talk to the media, first of all. And I could have probably really embarrassed myself and my family and my hometown if I would have said the things that I thought about saying. <laughs> but I was already kind of turning things around because I, I used that little trick to think of something to be thankful for. And then going forward, um, my teammates and I, we decided to, we all sat down and we all kind of started building um, more, more like building off that, that, that disappointment. And I believe that we won that medal in four man. I don't think we would have won a medal in four man if I would have won a medal in two man. I think that we raced better because of that. Uh, that event really brought us together as a team and we ended up winning that four man medal because the way that we came out of came through the two man so so for me i guess to get back to the question my spiritual life and everybody has their different spiritual life but for me my christian values helped me get through that uh, thank you yeah thank you for sharing okay. wow
So, Lyndon, I think you may have already kind of touched on this, but our question is, what are your most memorable moments at like the Olympic Games? Like, you know, walking into the stadium, meeting other athletes, traveling, competing. Um, this is so you'd, you'd think because I won a medal, they would be that. But mm -hmm. honestly, the coolest thing out of everything that I have experienced in the Olympics was the gold medal hockey game in Vancouver 2010. I got to go in this, I got to be in, G, it was called GM Place at the time. And I was sitting in there with, in a section of Canadian athletes. And we really, everybody, it, when you're an athlete, you're, you can get tickets to other events, but everybody wants tickets to the gold medal hockey game, right? And as bobsleigh, we race two man first week and then four man the second week. We don't have time to do anything else. And so I was bugging the, the lady was Marty McBean, who was in charge of giving out the tickets. And I was bugging her every time I saw her that I wanted tickets to the hockey. And because I knew Canada was going to be in the gold medal game. And, and, and it was after like we, we our race was on the second last day and the hockey game was on the last day. And so she said, win a medal and I'll get you your tickets. And so we won a medal in the four-man race. And then sure enough, the next morning, I got a ring. Pack your bags, come down to Vancouver, because our village was in Whistler, because we've got tickets for you and your teammates. So we hustled down, got on a bus, and went down to the game. And that game was so cool. I don't know if you guys remember it, but the Americans tied it late in the third. And then Sidney Crosby got that overtime goal. It was, <laughs> it was my most exciting moments of the Olympics, because I was just a fan. Other than that, I was, I was working, you know, I've even, I've coached, uh, 2018, I coached, uh, my, one of my athletes, Justin Cripps to a gold medal, which was really cool too, but I was working and I don't know, nothing can compare to that excitement of watching team Canada in the, in the rink with all the Canadians. It was like the roof was going to blow off the building. It was awesome. Cool. Wow. Yeah. That would be an experience of a lifetime for sure. All right, Dustin. Oh yeah, so that um, that's a tough story to beat. So I don't have anything like that. I mean, my my most uh, treasured Olympic experience, as far as watching stuff, came in the uh, I was in '92 as an alternate, and I was in 2008 as a coach. Uh, I was working uh, like Lyndon, but I had more time to watch. When I when you're there as an athlete in 2000, you go into Sydney, uh, you walk in the ceremonies, which really. Um, at the Summer Olympics, it's such a massive gathering of athletes. You're basically sitting in another stadium uh, for half a day, as they uh, heard as you heard they heard you in like cattle, and then you walk in and you walk around the stadium once, and you get to see these athletes. Um, so we, as wrestlers, were the second last event of the Olympics in Summer Olympics, right before the marathon. So we're always on the last day. So um, that that day where we get to come into Sydney. And march in the opening ceremonies, that's quite a rush. Just that initial moment where you walk into the stadium, you see the other athletes, you wander around on the field, get to see some of the NBA players, that type of thing. It's quite a, quite an experience. But then we go back two, three hours uh, north of Sydney, train and come back in the day we compete. And then you're like, hey, Olympics, here I am. And um, it's over. Everyone's packing up and the people are sick of it. And they're like, they're like aren't you guys going home yet? But uh, it was just a, a really great uh, feeling that last day. Um, it was bittersweet. I didn't get the uh, accomplishment that I wanted, but we had a team member win a gold medal on the very last day named Daniel Agali, um, who I got to coach uh, at SFU when he was there. He um, was in the 94 Commonwealth Games competing in Victoria, where I was with Canada. He was with Nigeria. He made a life-changing decision to leave his family and his friends and his life in Nigeria and defect and uh, try to become a Canadian citizen. Uh, barely spoke English at the time, ended up becoming a student at Simon Fraser University where I coached him in 96, 97 and 98. And in 2000, we were teammates on the Olympic team and uh, I got to watch him win Canada, the first ever Olympic gold medal in the sport of wrestling. So it was a pretty cool way to finish the Olympics. Um, and at the time I was well aware it was gonna be my last uh, crack at an Olympics as an athlete, so um, it was it was uh, it was a, it was a great ending uh, for us as a team. Um, and then he went on to wrestle in 2004 without the same results, but it was it was quite a moment for Canada wrestling. And I was glad I was part of it. That's really interesting that both of you have 
your kind of your top moments, someone else's accomplishment, even though you both had amazing accomplishments yourself. So that that's very interesting. That shows how unselfish you are and and what a team player. So what did it what did it mean to both of you to not only represent Canada at the Olympics, but to represent Saskatchewan? Well, for me, um, when I look back on my career, it meant it means an awful lot. It's something I'm very proud of. Uh, at the time, it was a bit more like a sense of relief in the fact that I'd been uh, working real hard at my chosen profession, which was which was as an amateur wrestler, um, placing very high at world events, uh, winning events all over the world, but yet I had failed to make the two most significant events of my career, which was the 92 and 96 Olympics. So it was nice to finally know that I could, uh, when people say wrestling, you mean Olympic wrestling? Oh, did you go to the Olympics? I could finally say, yeah, I did. So that was, <laughs> I could check that off my box. Um, I did wrestle uh, the reigning world champion second match, who was, uh, his name is Joel Romero. He went on to win a silver medal. Um, I beat a world champion that day as well from Latvia. So I'm not ashamed of the way I performed. I didn't get the medal I wanted, uh, but very few Olympians do get the medal that they wanted. I was proud of the way I represented both uh, Canada and Saskatchewan. And um, I wouldn't change a thing that I did in my preparation or while I was there, um, except if I could alter all, see, obviously the outcome of that one match. But yeah, I'm, I'm, I've always been uh, proud to be from Saskatchewan and it's, it's kind of, um, something I have to work for because everyone in my immediate family was born in Moose Jaw except me. I was born in Thunder Bay uh, while my dad was going to university there. And I was raised in Moose Jaw basically my entire life after they moved back. Went to all my public school, all my high school there. But uh, as Lennon will tell you, when they ask you to fill out things for the Olympics, some of them will say birthplace. They won't say hometown. So I'll have birthplace on there. We say Thunder Bay, Ontario. And then my current address is Port Moody, British Columbia, and Saskatchewan gets left out. So I'm always quick to make sure that everyone knows I'm from Saskatchewan. Um, and that's that's where I grew up, and uh, that's where I'm most proud to represent. Wonderful. And we're proud to have you. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. The they'll yeah, they'll ask you your birthplace. Luckily, mine is Saskatoon, but Saskatoon's not my like I'm from Humboldt. And I, even when they say like, even when they want to know your birthplace, I'll, I'll like right underneath hometown Humboldt. But, <laughs> but um, cause like when we grew up in Humboldt, we didn't like the guys from Saskatoon, <laughs> but that goes way back. Right. <laughs> Those were city slickers, right. We were, we were <laughs> rural boys and we were different, but um, yeah. Representing Saskatchewan was super important to me because I, I feel like um, like how I, I said earlier with the, the coaching system that I had and like the, the amateur sports and stuff that I had growing up in Saskatchewan is what created the person that I became that ended up winning a medal. Like I, 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 um, I don't think that, that without the, sh the shaping that I, that I got from Saskatchewan, I would have been an Olympic medalist. And uh, I ended up moving to Alberta to pursue my sport but I chose to have, like, I could have had, um, uh, when I was talking about our financial um, support, I could have chose either Alberta or Saskatchewan. It was the same amount of money, but there was no doubt in my mind that I was going to go through the Saskatchewan system to receive my, um, my, my funding. And I always really identify with other people from Saskatchewan. Cool little fact that most people, that no, hardly anybody knows is everybody who went to the 2010 Olympics, who was born and raised in Saskatchewan, won a medal. Wow. It was, it's, it, and it's like 10, 10 people who were actually born and raised in Saskatchewan. There's, there's quite a few people who were born in Saskatchewan, grew up somewhere else or vice versa. But if people were, all the, I think it was 10 or 11 of us that were born and raised in Saskatchewan. We all came away with the medal at 2010 and um, we were really proud of that. And there's other people that I meet uh, and I still meet and I, you're, you're, you're a Sasky, you're from Sasky. Oh, you're, you must be a good guy. <laughs> so um, I wore rough rider socks. Um, 
during the 2014 Olympics for every heat. So yeah, Saskatchewan is, is always a, I, I'm really proud of being from Saskatchewan. And I, I just, it's, it's shaped who I am. Well, that's awesome. And again, we're, we're really proud to have you too. So um, being that you were fortunate enough, Lyndon, to, to win that medal, sorry, we don't want to rub it in, Justin, but um, the question that a lot of people always ask medalists is, where do you keep your medal? So where do you keep your Olympic medal? Uh, I got this box that has, so after the 2010 games, everybody, or after the Olympics, I don't know if they've always done this, but they usually have this um, celebration in Ottawa where they invite, I don't know if they invite it. I think they invite it. Yeah, I went to the celebration in Ottawa when I didn't win a medal too. And we go and have this big celebration. Actually, it wasn't, it was in Montreal the second time I did it. So I think they picked different cities to do it in. And um, we got to go to the one that was in Ottawa and we got to meet Stephen Harper and he gave us, uh, what do they call it? A peace tower flag. So there's a peace tower on parliament and they like hang a new flag every day. And they have, there's a big line, like people, you can, as a Canadian citizen, you can request a peace tower flag and you can have one. That's the right of a Canadian, but you got to get in line because I guess it takes forever. But we got to jump the queue as I think they gave them to all medalists and came in this really cool box. And so I've got my Peace Tower flag in there and my Olympic medal. And that box sits like uh, it's in the basement on sort of this little mantle thing. And they ever like the kids will pull it out and show their friends sometimes. And another place that it often is is in the my golf bag because when you when you're there's always these golf tournaments and I get invited to be like a, a celebrity host or whatever and I use the medal as the ball marker so I use it <laughs> my team always thinks that's pretty funny so it's a great ball marker you can move your ball like the medals are pretty big you can change your life quite a bit with the ball marker the size of an Olympic medal <laughs> that's very cool all right Amy do you have another your next question Oh, we're on mute, Amy. <laughs> Hi, my apologies. So we are, just so everyone knows, we are seeing the questions in the Q&A in the chat. We just have a few left of our own and then we will get to everybody's questions at the end. All right, so my question is, what advice do you have to individuals or children who wish to pursue elite sports? Yes, I get to go first. Justin, I, I think I, Justin. I get to go first. Yeah, I think that um, I think first of all, good on you. But I I'd say that to anyone who wants to pursue sport at any level, whether it's recreational, uh, leisure, or uh, elite. Um, but if you choose to to you know set your sights on the Olympics, I would say um, seek out the best coaching you can find. Um, uh, don't go through your career with with blinders on. Have an open mind. Uh, because sometimes you will learn the most valuable lesson from the last person that you expect. Um, that's one thing I really liked about uh, my coach, my university coach, who's coached three Olympic champions um, and seven Olympic medalists. He would always encourage us after a couple of years of wrestling under him to go to as many camps, uh, expose ourselves to as many different training environments as we could. Uh, because he felt like we could learn from anybody. Um, I've seen other coaches that took the exact opposite um, sort of um, idea or, or frame of reference. And I, I feel like that their athletes stopped growing. Um, so I, I would just say that I would say, and also don't get frustrated um, when you're not getting the outcomes you want, because we all mature and develop at different, um, different rates. I have seen, um, the athlete who has come into their own at 28. Um, I've also seen the superstar who was a can't miss at 15. Um, and we all mature at different rates. So yeah, and, and never stop loving what you do. Uh, try to find that love uh, when, it, I mean, obviously training at elite level at any sport is difficult, uh, but try to make that that fun. Try to embrace uh, the, the, your, your, the passion that you have for it and, and, and enjoy the fun parts. I was fortunate enough to wrestle for our great country for 12 years. 
I spent the first six years of my career staring at uh, the roofs in third world country hotel rooms. Um, my last six years on the national team, I kept thinking this could be the last, this could be the last. I went and saw uh, the churches, the buildings, um, the tourist uh, activities. I embraced the cultures where I was and my results were just as good, if not better, uh, when I was when I was being the active tourist. So I say, don't miss what's going on around you. Um, and just when you're in your training environment, work as hard as you can and be open, be open for uh, advice. Right. Yeah, that's awesome advice. You're you can tell you're a coach. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's so many things that I think of, but what's important is uh, like uh, like people ask me this kind of stuff often, and, and and it's usually about like when do you specialize? And my usual comment is you try to push that off and specialize as late as you can. I think that if you if you uh, if you take it too seriously too soon, the fun goes away. Um, it's a curse and, and a blessing to be really good at a young age in a sport because then your expectations are, especially a, like where a sport like bobsleigh is different because we're all late entry, uh, you know, at adults. But most sports aren't like that. And, and, you know, you don't really have – like you like, – if you're a world champion pre-puberty, that doesn't mean a thing. It, and, or, or if you're the best hockey player in your province at, you know, 10, that doesn't actually, like, you, it doesn't actually mean that you're going to be in the NHL when you get older. So I think that not taking it too seriously too soon is really important. And then once you get to the, uh, you know, when you're in it and you are at the elite level, um, what Justin was saying about enjoying it. Um, for me, it's about um, don't neglect the, the other parts of your life. I feel like I always said to myself, do I have my house in order? And I would think about my, you know, the simple things. Am, am I living a good life? And, and, and for me, a lot to do, had a lot to do with my faith, but everybody has a, a picture of what they expect from themselves. And you can, as an athlete, you can become very selfish and very focused on only what you do. It's your job to be selfish, but you, you'll be a better athlete, I believe, is if, if you have your house in order and you're living, um, um, you're checking those boxes that you think a good person checks. And I really try to um, push that on the athletes that I coach. Does that make sense? Yeah. Hey, you bet. No, and that's, it's really interesting to note that both of you are now coaching in your respective sports. So that shows your dedication and, and, and your wanting to give back to, to your career. So on this road to excellence in your sport, obviously it has impacted your personal life and your career that you've chosen at the end. So would you say positively, negatively, has your choice impacted your life? And I think I know the answer, but. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's sort of a, you've heard us talk up till now, and we're both very passionate, and it's obvious, isn't it? That sport is, uh, was the only choice. <laughs> it was just, you know, I don't know about Justin, but for me, I was just, I have always been passionate about sport and I just think that it can teach you so much about uh, life in general. It's the micro, uh, ma micro, macro, the world, uh, the real world versus the wor little world that we live in sport. The lessons we learn in that little world of sport are, you can take those and use those in, in the bigger world. Like almost like nothing else. I feel like uh, it's really valuable. And I think that, um, I wouldn't, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have wanted to do it anything another way. That's for sure. How about you, Justin? Yeah, I mean, sounds like every time we answer that maybe Linda and I know each other, but uh, <laughs> I certainly learned a lot listening to him today. And I'm sure we have some acquaintances that I, I may know from Humboldt, but uh, 
for me, I mean, I didn't set out to become a wrestling coach. I got my business degree from SFU and I was a finance major. Um, my law, I was one of these guys who planned out everything for four years. And I had my list of things I was going to do. I was going to win a gold medal at the 96 Olympics in Atlanta. And then I was going to go become some sort of stockbroker or something like that. Uh, things changed when I didn't get, um, didn't make that 96 Olympic team. But uh, I can't imagine my life being there any different. Uh, someone once said, uh, make your passion your profession and you'll never work a day in your life. And that that's how I feel about my job. It's difficult. It's also um, all consuming at some points, uh, but the highs are just, they're second to the highs that you can have as a, as an elite athlete, but now I'm the coach. So I get to experience that same success and failure and ecstasy with those athletes that are pursuing their dreams. And I, and I enjoy coaching all of them. Some that have gone on to world elite level, some that were good college wrestlers, some that have just become amazing high school coaches and mentors to other people. Um, I love my job that way, but it's given me so much more outside of that. Uh, I met my wife through wrestling. She was a 2004 Olympian. Um, she's actually the very first woman ever to wrestle in the Olympic Games in Athens. Um, so that was life changing for me. Um, she's not heavily involved in the sport anymore, but when you're married to someone who wrestled at that level, she was a world silver medalist. Um, I don't have to do a lot of explaining to her. She knows the commitment in my, involved in my job. Um, she's a great, uh, support for me and I still managed to drag her around to do some wrestling camps here and there. Um, I would love her to come back to coaching full-time, but I, coaching full-time doesn't really uh, lead itself to two in the whole household doing it. Um, but it's changed that particular has changed my life in a, such a meaningful way, but so have all the friendships I've made along the way. I'm not saying that I'm only friends with wrestlers, but a lot of my best friends are, we have a lot in common. We have a lot to talk about. Um, and I just feel lucky for the, the types of people I've met along this journey and, to, and continue to meet um, even today. So I thank you guys for having me on this. That, it's just been a, a amazing listening to Lyndon. Thank you. Yeah. So um, one of my last questions is, I know that you've both have kind of already touched on this, but if there's anything else you want to add in this area, um, what would you say sport has given back to you? Whose turn is it? Justin. My turn first again? Yeah. All right. Um, I would say so many things that I've already touched on that it's given me obviously a job, a career, a family, a wife. Um, I have a love for something that I continue to learn about even though I've been doing it since I'm eight. But I think one of the things that my experience in sports has given me that a lot, a lot of uh, people I see don't have is I have uh, excellent perspective on, um, on my career and on wrestling. Um, I get to leave the sport on my own terms. Uh, I look back on it with super fond memories and I've learned a lot from my successes, but even more from my failures. And I get a chance to share those with uh, Canada's next uh, group of future Olympians. And I uh, feel that that's, that's, a, that's a great honor to have and I don't take it lightly. Thank you. Yeah, it just sounds like you're just a couple years older than me talking. <laughs> just, <laughs> it, it, it's really interesting, but you know, I mean, we'd be yeah, like um, I, I I I too have a career out of it, and um, learning more from your failures than your success is that that's that that just sticks out so much to me. Um, nothing like sport to keep you humble. There's no like there's it's tough like in the sport will always keep you humble. And when you're humble, you're always learning and you're always hungry, hungry to learn. And I think that in real life, we don't get humbled enough, but in sport, you do you get humbled a lot. When I spend my summers away, you know, from, from the bobsleigh team and all the aspects, uh, I get a different mindset that, that you don't, but then when I'm with the team in the winter time and we're on you know, we're trying to win and we're trying to create these, this environment and, 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 and we're working on equipment to make it the best. And we're trying to find the best lines on the track and we fail 
And, you know, sometimes you, you succeed, but you learn so much for those, from those little failures and those little humbling moments that, uh, you know, it keeps your ego out of the way. And you just, I gotta, I, I, I struggle, but I, it's my goal to try to carry that over into my life in the uh, off season as well, but it's, it's really tough. But when you're in the sporting world, um, yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, learning from failures is just huge. So that's, I think the biggest thing other than like, well, it gave me a job. The biggest thing that it's taught me is uh, that I've taken away from my life in sport is that that ability to keep learning. Yeah. So it seems like that has been able to translate over to like other parts of your life too, like just to keep learning, growing and being humble. Does that sound about right for you too, Justin? Yeah, for sure. All right, well, thank you so much for answering our questions. We do have some now from the audience that we are that we are going to take. And then if anybody else has questions um, as they're answering your questions, please just um, send them to our chat. Okay, so I'll read out this first one. Um, they, this person wants to know, how do you mentally prepare for a game, tournament, et cetera? have a particular routine to prepare mentally so like any game day rituals or anything like that how do you guys want to go how, how do we do the answers you go ahead Lyndon. okay uh i think uh the, the the deeper you get into sport and the more success you have in sports you learn that um routine and is, is your friend and preparing uh, it's just really, it's a, it, when you have a, a way that you always do things, it just takes a lot of stress off your mind. And I think every successful, I would imagine every successful athlete has, you know, some people <laughs> take it to a, a high, really high level where it's superstition and it can be dangerous, but it works for some people. But uh, having a routine and uh, it just, it helps, it helps you not worry about the things that aren't going to help you. And the things that aren't going to help you are is almost everything that you worry about. <laughs> so mm-hmm. you just don't have to think about those when you just focus on your routine. So as like as a bobsledder, we, we you know we'd have we had our equipment to prepare, and then you know like a long time before the race, it's a it's a it's a it's a nervous system sport where you need to ha- have the fast start. So you're doing things to have so your nervous system is prepped. So we'd start our preparation with not heavy work but you know doing stuff were really snappy and you'd be focused on how you feel your body and there's you stay focused on and and as the pilots we'd you know uh would visualize the track and you just kind of try to focus on the things that are going to help you in doing your best in the race and not everything else because everything else the things that you you're, you're you get really good at saying shut up to yourself i felt i feel uh, when you, cause there's things that want to come into your mind all the time that they won't help. And when you have real, when you're in a good place, when your house is in order that I like to say, I think you're really good at just saying, shut up, blocking all that stuff out. Cause you could be on the line and you could be thinking about what am I going to say on the podium after this? And that is definitely not going to help you. And, and, and like, just staying focused on what you, uh, what will help you and, and staying in your routine. That's great, thank you. How about you, Justin? Probably sounding a lot like a uh, uh, Linda Echo, but I think uh, he uses the uh, keeping your house in order. When I talk to my athletes about preparing for a competition, um, I want them to check off all the boxes they can leading up, so that there there's there's no outside noise. There's they're not worried about if this bill was paid or if they had to pen in this paper or, or any kind of distraction. So checking those types of things off. And then once you get to a competition, by the time you get to the level that uh, that Lyndon's competed at and myself, you've done it so many times, you should have a pretty good idea what your perfect day looks like and you try to recreate it. And when you're recreating that perfect day, um, you're trying to focus on process and not on outcome, which sounds like a really simple thing to do. Okay, just focus on processes and don't focus on outcomes. But now you're involved in sport at a high level where the people that win get the most money, they get the most fame, they get the best scholarships, they get the most attention, they get to continue for four more years. So the outcome is very important. So you have to have different ways 
to filter through those outcome thoughts. And even just Lennon's example about if you're on the, he's getting set to, to the start and he's thinking about his victory speech. Well, there's an out outcome thought right there and you got to push that away and you got to come up with something that's uh, process orientated. And in our sport, um, it, there's there's so many different types of athletes involved in the sport of wrestling. And one of the people they think they say about our sport is it's a wonderful sport because anybody can do it. You could be tall and skinny, you can be short and stocky, you can be flexible, you could be strong. But uh, whichever you are, you need to know what kind of athlete you are, and you need to put yourself in that proper mind frame. So I have my athletes usually rate um, their arousal level on the, going on the mat between one and ten. One is that guy who looks like, or girl, that looks like they just woke up and you look like, wow, they're not ready at all. But then all of a sudden they can perform like in that, in that state. Tens is the athlete who's bouncing off the wall, but maybe their style is conducive to that hyperactivity. You need to find out where you are. And I was always about a seven kind of guy. So I like to get a little wrapped up for the, for the match. But I would, uh, I had a set of routines that I, I'd, uh, crafted over the years I felt very comfortable with them and I could get myself in that uh, compete ready frame of mind and it worked really well for me over the years but I find in our sport it's a very individual thing uh, although it's a team sport when you walk out on that mat you're by yourself mm -hmm. so it takes a lot of tweaking for athletes to really figure out where they need to be to have their optimal performances. Thank you some very valuable insight so let me see if we have any other question yeah um so what is your um favorite sport to watch at the olympics and why i get to go first um you go first yeah so people ask me what my favorite olympics was uh and everyone expects me to say 2000 sydney um but 92 in Barcelona, I got to see a lot of great events. We were right there on the field for the 100 meter. Um, and in Beijing, we got to see almost anything we wanted. Uh, we were at the track. We were at the beach volleyball. We were at the volleyball, at the basketball. We saw the Dream Team play three times. My favorite Olympics to watch was the one in, in Vancouver um, in 2010 because uh, I had no affiliation with anything. I had no responsibilities. Um, my wife and I are both former Olympians, which brings you all kinds of uh, different perks at an Olympic Games, access to Canada houses, access to tickets. So we spent almost every day downtown Vancouver uh, watching all kinds of different things. So, um, but obviously that uh, hockey game that uh, was described by Lennon was one of, uh, one of my favorite Olympic moments of all time. I get to watch it at Olympic House on the TVs there with a bunch of the other Olympic athletes in there. That was pretty exciting because I think it was about an hour later, the women's team came through uh, with their medals that they'd won the night before. So um, that was a lot of fun. Uh, as far as just getting ready for this Tokyo Olympics, we've watched a lot of uh, swimming and gymnastics in my household. Um, Wrestling is by far the one I know the most about. Um, mm -hmm. So it's not quite as relaxing because I'm trying to analyze, learn, critique all of the above. Thank you. Yeah, for me, I already answered. That was like my Olympic highlight, right? The, the hockey game. And I, it's still my favorite sport. And during, for, so in the Winter Olympics, my favorite thing to watch is hockey. And then in the summer, I really like BMX. I, um, I kind of have taken it up. My, one of my kids was in BMX. And when I retired, I started riding. And I, I'm like, I'm one of the coaches for the local club now. And I, it's, an, it's, a, it's a lot like bobsled, actually. And it's really exciting to watch, especially at the Olympic level. You just never know who's going to win. It's it's kind of like a ski cross in the Olympics where the best guy could get taken out in the first corner. So it's really exciting. Uh, so that's my favorite uh, summer Olympic sport. Oh, thank you. Oh, that's awesome. So you had one for each season. Let's see, do we have any other... Um, so I had a question here about mental health. Um, do you have any like tools or activities or anything that you can recommend to support like, you know, healthy, like strong mental health, like when you're training or things that you can do to look after your mental health? My turn to go first. Um, yeah, so 
what I was talking about before with keeping your house in order is mental health. Mm -hmm. It's about, and, and it's, and it's so simple, but it's so hard. <laughs> it's the hardest thing to do, but it starts with your senses. What are you seeing? What are you listening to? What are you tasting? What are you smelling? That's, and it's literally that simple. It's a, it's the most, uh, that's the, you know, the, the base level of all of all experiences starts with our senses. And if we are control, if we're, if we're controlling the best we can, the things that we're sensing, then that will go to the next level and which is control. It, it, it'll, it'll, um, then we'll be thinking about the right things. And um, people say that you can't control your emotions, but I disagree. I feel like um, when you are, when you have your house in order, you can choose to think about like the, the story, the story I, I uh, shared about my, my bobsleigh um, failure. Uh, you, you can choose to have, to think of something that will change your, change your emotions. Um, in, in my world, I call it joy. Joy is more of a choice. You choose to think about things where happiness is sort of what's happening around you. And, when I talk about it, it sounds really easy, but in real life, it's very hard to have your house in order and to be uh, making the right choices about what your senses are doing. Um, but yeah, I think it's a simple topic, but a very um, hard to execute. As everybody knows, we, we all struggle with mental health, right? Yeah, for sure. I'm not sure I have anything that uh, to add to that that's going to help anyone more than what he just had to say there's some good advice there i would just say i think that we're light years ahead as coaches now than um coaches when i first under the scene in 88 89 where the old uh the the um the easy fix for mental health issues uh, put a tough pill on it or hey yeah just ignore that push it down real far i don't need to hear any of that stuff so i think the biggest thing right now is as coaches we're aware we're creating uh, or trying to create uh, an, uh, a safe area for athletes. Uh, athlete where, uh, where athletes feel like they can share about their fears, about their anxieties. We can talk about them and we have professionals that aren't, we're experts, I'm experts, I'm an expert in wrestling. I know a lot about strength and conditioning, about different training mechanisms, about yearly tra training plans. I'm not an expert on mental health. But yet, in my capacity as head coach at SFU, I, I'm, I'm responsible for these 50 young men and women. So I need to be aware. I need to take my, uh, my job uh, very seriously and understand the responsibilities to this generation and their mental health needs. So I feel like my university has given me all, a lot of tools, a lot of different um, people to help me with that. So I don't have to try to do it all by myself. But still, some of the things that I'm seeing from these experts are things that we knew back in the day. Um, having checklists, as, as Lynn likes to say, keep, keeping your house in order, but going back to, to journals and, and saying things are good and I, I'm doing all these things right. And then if I'm still feeling anxious, uh, there's breathing activities that you can do, just slowing down your world. Uh, Im imagery, like laying down, listening to some nice white noise, picturing yourself doing something you love. It could be wrestling or bobsleigh, but it could just be on a beach. So these are all things that we're hearing from the experts now that we knew a little bit about in my day, uh, but I'm learning more each and every year. And I, I think that our, because of that, our athletes are better equipped. They're better equipped than ever. And as I become a better coach, maybe they'll be more, more equipped. Oh. oh, thank you. Um, so I was wondering, does, if anybody else has any questions, just go ahead and send them through the chat. Um, Vicki, did you have any questions that you wanted to ask? Well, I was curious with, um, with Lyndon. So you competed at two Olympic games. One was in, in Sochi and one was in Vancouver. So describe the difference competing on home soil, um, versus, you know, in Russia, which is, you know, quite a distance away. <laughs> what were the biggest differences? In Russia, like, you know how they say everything's bigger in Texas? Everything is definitely bigger in Russia. 
they were they put on one heck of a show i know that i remember during the olympics like especially the british media they were kind of trying it seemed like they were trying to like they're the pot about like the western world kind of still fights a little bit with russia so politically they were trying to make it every thing seem like it was not going well in russia but it was very impressive they put on like they're like the the bobsled track was this amazing wooden had this wooden roof on it that looked like a cathedral like it looked like art it was huge they had a running track suspended above the bob trip track that we could warm up on like the 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 opening ceremonies like <laughs> vancouver's opening ceremonies i thought were awesome they were hilarious and they were kind of like canadians making fun of themselves but like the the price that put on the canadian opening ceremonies versus the price like they had these that like you can just tell money was no factor in the russian games like they were like russia was russia's olympics was like a game for the russian people to feel proud about themselves and i think they nailed it the people who were there like the fans who were there were russians there wasn't a lot of outside fans where canadian the canadian olympics was uh was a celebration of canadians you know everything that we are we're kind of like self-deprecating you know what i mean it was it was just totally a different feel and both olympics nailed it but they couldn't be further apart from uh they they couldn't be further apart from the feel but they were both very they were great experiences just just different style did you feel more pressure competing on home soil Yo, yeah, <laughs> like, and I wasn't as good at dealing with it at the time. I did better. Like, I won a medal in 2010, but I didn't win a medal in 20, 2014. But like, I didn't think I, I underestimated how. Like, I remember going to the line for the two man race for my first run, and the whole like the place was packed, and everybody had the red mittens on, and they were all there to cheer for me, and I didn't think. Like I was a little bit, I was naive. I didn't realize how much that was going to affect me. It was, but it was awesome. It was like the, I, I'm still getting a little bit of chills. Of just trying to think about it. You know what I mean? Like going to the line and, and it's maybe why I crashed in the two men race. I was a little like, um, Justin talked about how he needed to find, uh, he liked to be at a seven between one and 10 and every athlete needs to find what, you know, where that they perform best. And I was probably at a 22 going to the line and I, and I was so, I was just, I was so caught up in the, like I was, I, we pushed, it was amazing for our push. We pushed, like I have the, we had the fastest start at the Olympics and I'm not, it wasn't my strength being a starter, but I was, when I drew, when I look back and critique why I crashed in that race, I was just so caught up in having a perfect run that I, when I made a small mistake, I wasn't willing to even compromise my, my lines. Cause I was like, I knew it was going to be perfect. Cause I was just so excited. And so it just was, uh, I, just, I wasn't where I needed to be. And so I learned from that experience going forward and I'm, I'm a better coach for it. I'm a, I, it. Like there's lots of things that it, it taught me, but oh yeah, the pressure was, but it was good pressure. It was really fun. Yeah. And I'm glad I learned, you know what I mean? Like that crash was, what would I talk about when I have these interviews now? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Overcoming adversity. So we had a question from somebody and they would like to know what was the food like at the Olympics? Um, I could go with that. I know that it's going to be a little different for the winter and the summer, right? The summer, I think has uh, more sports and more athletes in more countries. Uh, so it might be a bigger, I've never been in the athletes village. And I know in, in uh, at least in Vancouver, they had two villages, one in Whistler and one in Vancouver, but the Sydney village is like, if you can imagine a food court, the size of uh, the floor at Rogers arena, that's, that's what it is. You walk in there and you can get whatever you want, whenever you want, how much of whatever you want. Uh, there's healthy choices. There's McDonald's. Um, there's anything you th that you could think of to eat. Uh, you get a coin in, at the Sydney Olympics, you get a coin with your accreditation, it goes in your credit. And anytime you see a Coke or a Powerade machine throughout the entire city of 
uh, Sydney, Australia, you could put it in there and you could pop it and you get whatever you want out of it. Um, which sounds wonderful, except for wrestling is a weight based sport. So <laughs> you're spending the entire time you're there weighing yourself every hour to make sure that you're going to make the weight for your, uh, your event. But for me, I was a 185 pound athlete and, uh, I was coming down from about two or six. So when I finally got a chance to enjoy the food, it was a 24 hour uh, food binge, but it, it is one of the most spectacular um, food courts you've ever seen in your life. And I remember uh, there's a, a legendary wrestler. So if, if um, he was a hockey player, he'd be Wayne Gretzky. So this guy is the, uh, he had the opportunity to become the most decorated wrestler of all time. He won three Olympic gold medals and nine world championships. But at the Sydney Olympics, he lost to somebody who nobody knew. And everyone said, did you see Satyev at the Olympics? I said, oh, yeah, I saw him a few times. Where did you see him? At McDonald's. He was always at the McDonald's. <laughs> so when he lost at the Olympics, he spent the next 36 hours sitting at the McDonald's in the uh, in the food court. So that's he he um, he drowned his his misery with Big Macs and cheeseburgers. <laughs> Wow. Especially that thing about the coins. So you could use that anywhere in the city, like even outside the Olympic. Yeah. And then just going back to what I said before about wrestlers getting the raw end of the deal with the last day. Yeah. So then about 12 hours, 13 hours after you're done competing, it doesn't work anymore, but we <laughs> took advantage of it for, for half a day. Nice. It's yeah, he nailed it. That's exactly the, the experience at the future. They give you a fob thing that has like a little thing inside it, and you can any vending machine will get you whatever you want. And you can eat the <laughs> the, the, the funny thing is that the, the cafeteria is open all the time, you can go at three in the morning if you want. But uh, yeah, it, it's it's a another experience within the Olympics that depending on yeah, your sport, you can take advantage of it. Or, or not they're mostly the mo in the winter olympics um bobsledders are pretty much the only ones at the mcdonald's everybody else is are, <laughs> most of the other sports are small people and the bobsledders are at the mcdonald's all the time because they're always most of them are trying to put on weight <laughs> cool okay um so we have about six minutes left are there any last minute questions before we wrap up tonight Well, Lyndon and Justin, if there's in, if there's, isn't anything that like, if there's something that we didn't cover tonight that you would just share with everybody, um, would you like to go ahead and do I, that? I, I, know have that a, I have a question for, um, for Lyndon, uh, just with both Olympics. I know one being in Vancouver, the other being in, in uh, Sochi. Did, uh, how much family did you have to come to both? And did you find that dealing with their wants and needs and, um, you know, having to spend time with them, did that affect uh, your, 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 your preparing? Or I guess you guys are a team event, so you must have to schedule all of that stuff with your other three teammates in the four-man. But um, did you find one easier than the other? Well, it, yeah, no one came. None of my family came to Sochi. It was just too big of a trip. But, uh, yeah, all my family and, like, uncles and aunts and everybody I knew growing up almost was in Vancouver. But they, you know, it's like being in a really nice minimum security prison. They, they can't, they don't have, they have no access to you, you know, and, and, and they knew going ahead that they went, the only time I really saw them was like, if they came to watch training or at the race, they were uh, family and friends had really good seating. So I'd see them after my run and say hello or something, but uh, yeah, it, yeah, there, there's, it's pretty tough to, cross the line for the public to come and so uh, mix with the athletes but I did find time like I, I remember my oldest daughter was uh like six at the time and I brought got to bring her in to the village and she got to go and come to the garage and see the sleds and help us do she didn't help us do anything but she got to hang out and so I have pictures with her from that which is I, I think a super cool memory and something that she'll cherish uh, but um, nothing as far as distracting in a bad way. I didn't think. 
Oh, thank you. So we did get another question from the audience and we'd like to know, um, what advice would you like to give your younger self? Um, I don't know if I would, I, cause then how would you become, like, I think that I'm still like, you don't want to, you, you learn from the, we were saying earlier that you learn from the mistakes and without the mistakes, who would you be? So I think I tell my younger self, just be ready, <laughs> learn from your mistakes. That's what I tell my, my younger self. I think, uh, yeah, kind of echoing what Lennon said, I think we are who we are because of everything we we experienced. And, and if you go back and change one thing, who knows how that's going to affect you. Um, I would tell myself a couple of things, though. I think if I could sneak them in there, one is stretch more. Um, I just turned 50. <laughs> I always laughed at those guys that were stretching. I uh, do extra sets of weights. Um, I'm paying for it now. The other thing is... Um, I was part of a couple of multi-sport games, uh, Commonwealth Games, Pan Am Games, Olympic Games. Uh, I gave away a lot of stuff that my kids would probably really appreciate. So I would, I would hang on to a few more, a little more memorabilia. I know I always lived in Vancouver and always had space issues. So I just, and people always wanted your gear. I know Lynn probably knows this, that probably they get it worse than anybody, but they think you went to the Olympics and there was a tickle trunk there full of free t-shirts. So everyone, you know, thinks that they should get one. But uh, um, I gave away a lot of that stuff. Uh, luckily my mother was pretty good at hoarding some of it. So some of it made it back to my kids and stuff. Thank you. Okay, so Vicki, was there anything else you'd like to add quick before I just wrap up tonight? Um, no, not really. Just, you know, keep hold on to that stuff, Justin and Lyndon, because, you know, the Hall of Fame needs display stuff <laughs> and, you know, always, always donations to the Sasport Hall of Fame because we'd love that. And we're, we're really looking forward to welcoming you to being part of our, our next class of Hall of Fame inductees. There's some pretty big names that you will be joining and uh, we can't wait to, to have your names on there. Thank you so much for doing this with us tonight. It was, it was wonderful. It's great to see you. Yeah. So thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. Um, we've come to the end of our time today. And thank you to both of our Olympians, um, Justin and Lyndon, for sharing your Olympic journeys with us tonight. Um, I've definitely learned a lot from each of you. Um, if you are interested in learning more about health and wellness or looking for some workout videos, check out Canopy and Hoopla. Um, Canopy has a variety of documentaries about health and wellness, and Hoopla has a variety of free home workout videos. Both of these resources can be accessed online through the Regina Public Library website. When I sent you the Zoom link for this program, I also emailed you a link to the online evaluation form. I encourage you to fill it out. It only takes a few minutes, and your information is crucial in helping us plan and create programs um, that help us um, communicate the value of the library. If you did not receive the registration link email for this program, the link to the survey evaluation is also in our chat. And one last thing before we go, I want to mention something really cool. So we have a new customizable events guide service. So it's called My Events Guide, and it's found under your account menu when you log in with your public library card. And by selecting your preferences, you can create up to three personalized guides that show you all the upcoming library programs and events that match your selections. You can view it or change it any time from your account and it will always be current. You can also subscribe to have an updated guide sent to your email every month. Another great feature is you can register right from the guide. So we'll hope, we hope you check it out and it'll just be a much easier way to read more library programs on our website. And I'd like to thank you all again for joining us tonight. Yes. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye everybody. Take See care. you guys. Yeah, bye. 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 Awesome. Oh, thank you. <laughs> we did it. I think we did. Is that everybody else off the call now? Yes. So I think we capped out at like, I think we ended up with like 12 or 13. I'm going to say 13 people for the stats. Awesome. That was great. Yeah. Oh, I'm happy we
we did this, we'll send you the recording and it's great because we got to, we got Lyndon